agreeing to be interviewed. Very welcome. Um, I wanted to ask you first a little bit about kind of the values underlying the Learn Together curriculum. So first of all, you know, quite briefly, because we have some stuff on this, but where did the idea to develop one shared curriculum for all Educate Together schools come from? Okay, so I'm going to take you on a brief little historical journey in relation to that. Uh, in 1997, 1998, I undertook my master's research here in DCU and part of my work was obviously a thesis, a research thesis and I decided that I wanted to look at the values within Educate Together Schools. What were the specific values within Educate Together Schools? And the title of that particular work is called Valuing Difference. And at the time it was a small scale piece of work because you only had, I think, 12 schools uh, in existence. Um, so from that, it began to emerge that it wasn't just enough, like all research, it wasn't just enough to look at um, the values, but how these values were transmitted. And again and again, it came up in interviews with teachers, in interviews with former students, in uh, particularly in interviews with principals, that uh, transmission of values was most evident in what was then known as the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it just kept coming back to that. Mm -hmm. And as part of that then, it also began to emerge that there were individual or independent core curricula out there. Mm -hmm. All of them based on the original Doki one, but beginning to veer and move and change. Mm -hmm. And there also seemed to be some concern that new, what we would call educations, like uh, social, personal, education, SP, HE, all of the various things were the walk tall program, all of these were in a way almost taking over from the core curriculum. So there was a sense that the identity of the core curriculum was being lost and that if it was meant to represent the ethos of what an Educate Together school was, that this was a difficulty and this was a problem. Okay. So that's where it began. Right. Um, and just a little bit of your own role then, when the actual work came to start drawing things together, did you see yourself more as a parent or as a teacher, even though you weren't teaching in an Educate Together school, as a member of the Educate Together community, as a facilitator? How did you see your role as a researcher? Yeah, I mean, we talk about the positionality of research and in my own PhD, when I went on to do that, I talk a lot about positionality because this was an issue for me. I was an insider, but I was also obviously a researcher. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to dissociate all of those various elements and all of those various roles. Mm -hmm. So of course I was a parent. Mm -hmm. I was a parent of children in the Educate Together sector at the time. I was also a director. I was on the board of directors at the specific time where I undertook the PhD research. Mm -hmm. So that carried with it a certain number of responsibilities as well. Mm -hmm. I'll always be a teacher, mm -hmm. regardless of whether I was teaching in an Educate Together school or lecturing here in DCU. So my whole knowledge, I suppose, of methodologies and curriculum cycles and stuff like that was obviously going to come into play as well. So mm -hmm. I wasn't any one thing, but I had to think long and hard about my role um, mm -hmm. as a researcher from an insider perspective. Mm -hmm. It certainly gave me, I suppose, a huge amount of richness. It gave me access, which is always a good thing. Uh, but also from, I suppose, an objective perspective, um, I talk about the lens of objectivity in my own research so I felt that I had to filter everything through quite a number of people to ensure that the voice being heard wasn't just my voice. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so what happened then when you started to look at the different core curricula that were out there I mean you mentioned that they were kind of starting possibly to diverge a little bit um, what kinds of differences did you find? I mean, what, what type of divergence was that? I suppose the key divergence really, and that became evident very, very quickly, uh, the first questionnaire I distributed, was in the titles. Mm. I mean, core curriculum was how 
I would have remembered it as a parent within the sector. And I'd also worked, by the way, on the core curriculum committee mm -hmm. in the development of a new core curriculum for North Bay Educate Together. Uh, so it, it really was, you know, I, I, found I had copies of all of the curricula that were available at the time, and I still do mm -hmm. have copies of these. And the titles were so divergent. Mm -hmm. Like some of them stuck strongly to core curriculum. Some of them had religious in the title, and that became an issue, I suppose, later down the road of the research. Um, some of them were moving more and more towards, as I said, bringing in these other educations that thankfully had begun to emerge in an Irish education setting. But there was a, that sense that in some cases it didn't seem clear as to exactly mm -hmm. what the focus was. Mm -hmm. And was the divergence kind of seen as a, as, were there any positives to it or was it all negative? Qu quite a number of positives, obviously the, the main one being autonomy. Mm. Having that, I suppose, local approach was very, very evident. And also I would say engagement, the level of engagement of parents and other stakeholders. That was uh, coming across as very, very positive mm -hmm. because there was an ownership being taken. Yeah. The difficulty though we were arose in 1999-2000 when Educate Together became the patron body for all of the new schools that were opening. Mm -hmm. So while individual patrons could develop their individual curricula, now suddenly Educate Together was tasked with the job of actually producing a core curriculum for the sector. Mm. And this, I suppose, added a new urgency mm -hmm. to the need to review and look and come up with a new model. Um, I noticed a comment in one of your articles about um, one of the things that was thrown up by the research was um, that in some cases, at least, it was mostly teachers involved in de developing the curriculum and that the, the voice of the parent and the voice of the student weren't always yes. evident. Um, do you think that is something that was then overcome through the development of the Learn Together? Or what yeah, it was that? a question I would have posed when I began to look at, obviously as part of the questionnaire, I had a section on the existing curricula that were out there and I had asked who was involved. Mm -hmm. And in a high percentage of cases, it was just the teachers. Mm. There was a committee formed of teachers. Um, so I had seen it work, I suppose, where parents were involved. Mm. And to me, um, I have records of all of that as well with North Bay, where the voice of the children mm. was also included very, very strongly when we were developing our own uh, educate or uh, North Bay core curriculum. Yeah. So I saw how it worked and I suppose I wanted it in as much as possible to replicate that if we were going to go down the road of developing a common curriculum for the new emerging schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. And was there ever any kind of doubt as to whether a common curriculum for all the schools um, was the wrong way to go perhaps, especially in terms of keeping that parent involvement and that that learner involvement, the student involvement, um, was there any controversy around that? Um, yes, uh, I wouldn't use a stronger term as controversy, but we like that sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular for some schools, they had just developed, for example, North Bay, had only very recently developed a new curriculum, which had taken a lot of time and effort. So. Yeah, there were issues around ownership, but there was never an obligation on the existing schools to opt in to this new common curriculum. Mm. It wasn't an obligation. It certainly was a recommendation, and their voices come through very strongly, mm. uh, particularly through two of the authors mm. uh, of, of the Learn Together curriculum. But there was never an obligation on them. Uh, and yes, obviously there were there were issues. It was interesting though to return to my research after the core curriculum had been launched. It was launched in 2004. I continued to research until 2006 mm. and it was interesting to see the huge percentage of the existing schools mm. that adopted for Learn Together.
Right. And what was that a high percentage at the time or? And then I just said. Okay. So just about how many schools kind of had bought in? This is um, perhaps a little bit off the record, but my memory says that of the existing schools, those pre-2000 schools, that all, with one exception, had opted in by 2006. And there had been formal launches of the new Learn Together curriculum in a number of those schools as well. Okay. And how would you see the job of a school now to maintain that ownership and that autonomy, which people have said is a positive thing, and that involvement of parents and children, given the fact that there is a shared curriculum? How, how does the curriculum facilitate that ownership? Well, the whole idea of the curriculum, it began, uh, the term blueprint was used at one stage with regard to the curriculum. And um, we lost bl blueprint simply because I suppose we went so far down the road of developing an actual curriculum. Um, so th the idea always was that it wasn't going to be controlled that there wasn't going to be a central body controlling this. So as the curriculum cycle goes, you know, if, if you look at Kolb and the curriculum cycle, there was always that notion that the schools would deliver it, evaluate it, assess it, re-evaluate it and develop it. And that there was always that it was central to the school itself. So as issues arose, for example, in the whole concept of activation, which is a very strong part of the curriculum, that that activation was on issues that arose within the school itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's not prescriptive. Mm -hmm. um, also, we would, we would have recommended and we would continue to recommend that there be one person within the school who was appointed to oversee mm -hmm. the development of the Learn Together curriculum within their specific school mm -hmm. and that it be tabled at staff meetings. Yeah. Um, so if there was any danger that I suppose people were just becoming prescriptive and used to what was happening, that it would uh, be re-energised mm -hmm. at every staff meeting. And it's up to the individual school then to ensure, obviously the voice of children is always going to be there, but the mm -hmm. voice of parents as well. So just maybe talk a little bit about that line between kind of development and then activation of, of the curriculum. What, what do you mean by activation? Um, built into the curriculum, we talk about an activation cycle. So we're not just talking about the delivery of a program, but we're asking, even from junior infants up in the spiral curriculum, that the children begin the process of activation. So for example, if you're looking at equality and issues of equality, that they actually undertake activating particular aspects of that. So they look at an issue, for example, like discrimination. Mm -hmm. And they look at it from a particular uh, or specific perspective. And then that they activate change, mm -hmm. that they become change agents. Mm -hmm. And the term change agent is actually built in to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think the term change agent is used. Mm -hmm. So our idea is that this is not just about something that happens in a school setting, but it's also about our role, I suppose, as citizens in a multicultural, intercultural environment. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by activation. And that is very much the remit of the particular school, depending on the issues that arise. Right. Okay. Um, how easy or difficult was it to identify common values given the kind of range of belief systems in the broadest sense represented in the schools and also educational aspirations and educational values? Was it difficult to identify common values? No, actually, uh, not at all. Um, I suppose I would have worked from a theoretical framework in the, in the first piece of research on the whole notion of consensus pluralism. And the notion of consensus pluralism is that we do identify a set of common or core values. And these began to emerge very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and there was very strong agreement, not just from individual schools, but across schools, and also across the various groupings within schools, be it the children or the uh, teachers or principals. Mm -hmm. So no, it wasn't difficult at all. Um, 
the core value that emerged was respect, not surprising, in an educate together setting. I mean, you broaden that out to the notion of respect for others, respect for self, and um, how we are respectful. That, that became the core value. Mm. And the second one, interesting enough, was self-esteem. Mm. Uh, some would say that that's very obvious in Educate Together Children, but it was about developing self-esteem and being able to articulate that. So the commonalities of value wasn't a difficulty at all. Mm -hmm. um, the transmission of values can mm. sometimes be a little bit more problematic. And in my larger piece of research, that does emerge. It doesn't relate to the uh, Learn Together curriculum as such, but yes, uh, how we transmit values and I suppose um, the messages we send out about values can differ from school to school. And we would expect that to be the case. Mm. But the uh, recognition that there are core values and that they relate back to the four principles of Educate Together, that wasn't at all difficult. Right. Just on that question of transmission of values, um, would you see that as a, you know, maybe the main aim of the curriculum to transmit values, or um, some people would find that a very strong uh, word, you know, that we are setting out to transmit values, particularly perhaps for young teachers, you know, coming into this job and thinking, oh, you know, I have to transmit values. It sounds like quite a um, an onerous task perhaps. Was there any kind of discussion around that at the time? It certainly was, but in all aspects of our lives we transmit values. Um, the difficulty is sometimes we, we aren't aware of that. Mm. So if we're not prepared to identify values and have at least a set of core values that we operate from, then we are all transmitting values and they may not necessarily be the values that the organisation is comfortable with and mm -hmm. um, so it's not just we're not being prescriptive and saying you must come up and transmit a set of values but you must have an awareness as you're working on such a sensitive area as for example moral and spiritual development that you by being there are automatically a transmitter of values mm -hmm. and it's raising that awareness in how we do it yeah. it's not forcing people to do it it's there anyway mm -hmm. Um, was there any discussion around just the language in terms of a curriculum? And you've, you've already mentioned that it was going to be a blueprint and it turned mm. into a curriculum. You know, was the idea ever that it might be a syllabus or a programme? I mean, how did, how did it come to be a curriculum specifically? You're going back, I suppose, to one of the earlier questions. Um, that term curriculum was there from the outset. You know, when you look back to the first Doki mm. curriculum, it was the core curriculum. Mm. Uh, when you go to the Department of Education as a patron, you must present what we loosely term a religious education curriculum. Mm. So curriculum was always going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't think outside of that it was always going to be there and we fashioned every, everything we did around that concept of mm -hmm. curriculum. And in the end it became a, a spiral curriculum. Um, it, was that something that was always going to happen as well? or No, uh, we took a decision. Um, in the early parts of the research I was on my own, obviously working, getting the voice of all of the stakeholders through fairly extensive ethos conferences which were part of Educate Together mm. back in 2001, 2002, uh, 2003 and the National Forum. Mm. Um, coming on board then you had uh, two principles of existing schools mm -hmm. and you also had um, a parent mm -hmm. who was coming from a very very different discipline. So the notion of the spiral curriculum was that it would marry with all of the other curricula that had been introduced as part of the new primary school curriculum in 1998 I think it came into yeah. being, 1999. Mm -hmm. So the timing was right, so we were getting used to writing curricula, like mm -hmm. the child shall be enabled to. Mm -hmm. So the idea that it would be a spiral curriculum emerged very quickly, nice. uh, so that it would sit nicely with the other curricula that the teachers were mm -hmm. using and beginning to get used to in their schools. 
And then what about the term religious? You mentioned that already, that some of the existing curricula in the schools might have been called religious education curriculum or that the word religion would have been there. Um, what types of discussions were had around whether or not that word would be retained? Yeah. Again, we were back to uh, ethos conferences and the national fora for that voice. And we looked at the number, I think there was something like, um, by the time this was really going, I think there was something like 18 different titles in use. And these were presented mm -hmm. at a conference by myself. And uh, people were asked then to think about it. And religion featured in not as many as you would imagine. It, it, it didn't feature in, in uh, I think it was maybe four or five of them by mm. this stage. Um, there was an issue that religion had to be retained and people went back to the minutes of uh, national forums mm -hmm. uh, from years previously. So there was a, a point where we thought that we would have had to maintain. So you were saying that religion was in the title of some of the the core curriculum, but um, and, and some people felt it, it needed to be maintained. Yeah, there, there, there was a question uh, that there might be, I suppose, a legal issue mm -hmm. that religion would have to be maintained. And people were asked to go back and look at the minutes from a national forum from, oh, back into the 80s mm. uh, to look at the recommendation. But it transpired, we, we inquired about it, and religion didn't have to be part of the title. Right. So, um, then I suppose we took ideas from people as to what the title, what they felt would be a good title. Mm -hmm. And um, ethics kept coming up. And a lot of people had ethical education anyway in their existing title. So an ethical curriculum. So we'd kept curriculum. Core was gone because if you're in education, core has a different connotation. Core actually refers to uh, maths and English, the core subjects, the mm -hmm. core curriculum, uh, Maths, English and Irish from our perspective. So it was felt that it was confusing really to keep core in there. Mm -hmm. But ethical was definitely going to feature. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I suppose we had a eureka moment, um, learn together to live together, being the motto of Educate Together. We thought, well, why not take the title, learn together, an ethical curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that's how it emerged. Okay. Um, so there was no kind of looking at other curricula elsewhere that were called ethical education curricula or? Um... No, we did look at them, um, not from the perspective of titles, but we certainly looked at what was happening in Britain mm. and spent a lot of time actually examining um, the kind of uh, curricula that were being produced in mm -hmm. Britain in particular and indeed in France mm -hmm. and from my own research I had an example from Germany mm -hmm. as well um, so we did look at them but not from a title perspective but, but certainly from a content mm -hmm. perspective we did uh, examine other curricula. And why do you think it was that the word ethics kept coming up? Why did that come through strongly? Because I think people felt that it was so at the core of what Educate Together does. Mm -hmm. So we were, uh, I think it's Felicity Hines talks about the ethical school. And I think Educate Together schools very much are ethical schools. Mm -hmm. So uh, ethics kind of underpins mm -hmm. what we do within the Educate Together sector. And I think that was the, the key reason why it kept coming up. We had to go back and we had to see what were the values underpinning this and from an ethical perspective, were we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. So it didn't surprise me that mm -hmm. ethics appeared as much as it did in the title. Okay. Um, okay, just to go on then, the actual process of developing the curriculum and how the strands emerged. Um, was there any kind of discussion around what should or shouldn't be included? Um, what were the, the was there a lot of um, were a lot of schools doing similar things, or was there a lot of divergence? Did things have to be left out? Uh, yeah, I, from from the outset when I was working as 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 a sole trader, <coughs> a sole researcher, I certainly had looked at what were the key themes 
as well as the values, but also what were the key themes mm. in the existing curricula. <coughs> Excuse me. So what, what emerged at the end, you had a list of maybe six, seven key themes. Mm -hmm. And obviously four of those you still have. Uh, but for example, uh, equality and justice. Human rights would have been in there as mm -hmm. well. Um, but that became submerged into mm -hmm. equality and justice. Uh, social and personal was very much there with moral and spiritual. Uh, but when we thought about it, um, we thought, well, social and personal is being covered by other curricula. And to some extent, so was human rights being right. covered by other curricula. Um, so a lot of them, I suppose, it was teasing around with the existing seven, I think it was seven themes that originally existed, and seeing, well, how could we condense these? Mm -hmm. Take out the overlap that was occurring mm -hmm. be, from the other educations that were out there because we felt this was confusing mm -hmm. our own specific curriculum. The one that remained in for a long time was uh, the area of grief and loss right. but it was felt in the end that that was to some extent covered by other curricula and it was an area that maybe was there in the four strands that was certainly in three of the four strands that we maintained. Mm -hmm. So um, that one remained in the longest. As a specific strand. As a specific strand. The others played around with titles. Mm -hmm. Like when I began to talk to the children about this, social and personal was there with moral and spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, when I began to talk to the children, uh, justice and human rights were going together. Mm. Um, but what emerged from, from talking to the children, they began to talk about equality. Mm. Their major focus was on equality. So at each stage as well, all of these were taken back to national fora and to um, ethos conferences. Mm. And people were given an opportunity to look at the titles, mm. the possible titles as they emerged, and also to look at the strands. Mm -hmm. And people were given an opportunity to order the strands, what they considered to be most important. Right. And was looking back through my notes before this morning, and moral and spiritual stood out there as the one that people rated as the key one and the most important. Is that very interesting? Yes. Because anecdotally what you find is that that's actually the strand that teachers find hardest to teach. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the one that the most difficulty or questions arise around probably is belief systems. Yeah. Even after the evaluation that was conducted recently, it was belief systems that was coming out. But going back uh, in terms of order of importance, moral and spiritual came out there very, very strongly. As it did, by the way, with the children. Right. It was also conducted mm -hmm. this exercise with the children, and that came out as the really important one. That's really interesting. I mean, belief systems comes up again and again as um, the strand which some people say is taught most, some people say is quite easy to teach because there's a lot of material out there. Um, was there any, was there ever any discussion around possibly giving extra time to belief systems or were they always seen as four equal strands? They were always seen as four equal strands and if we'd gone according to the surveys, you know, in giving time we probably would have given more time to moral and spiritual. But I think over time things change. Mm. Um, for example, as a value, the environment was very low when I first conducted my research mm. back in 1997-98. By the time we began to put this together, the environment was way up there in terms of what the children saw as an important value, respect for the environment. So things change mm. over time. Mm. And I think the belief system, you're right, it's the one that people can maybe come to terms with more easily than others, but uh, we never ever considered that it would give more time, no. Mm -hmm. okay. Another question that often comes up about how the curriculum ended up is the particular belief systems that are named within the belief system strand. Mm -hmm. um, was there much discussion around what should or shouldn't be included as a belief system? Yeah, um, 
I can't go to the Central Hotel anymore because all of our meetings took place in the Central Hotel. So you have no idea of the amount of discussion. I have emails which track, mm. uh, I suppose, the whole process. So we were very, very uh, meticulous about all of this. Sorry, I've lost the thread of the Belief question. systems? Yes, what was uh, the, 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 the six belief systems. Uh, there was final agreement that across most works in this field, um, that there was an acceptance that there were what was considered to be the six key religions. So for example, Christianity covers a multitude there. Mm -hmm. but. We felt if we began tinkering around with it, we wouldn't know where to stop. Yeah. You know, what we term a belief system it could come down to, for example, individual belief. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to the children about that, they were quite funny about that. You know, uh, they saw immediately the issues that could emerge if we all had individual belief systems. So it was really a way of saying, well, there are six recognised belief systems out there. Mm -hmm. That was never stopping people engaging with other belief systems. Mm -hmm. And very quickly it emerged that humanism was one that didn't feature. Mm. And, you know, as I said, I didn't stop with the curriculum. I continued my own research. And as part of that, I met with the education officer uh, for the Irish Humanist Association. And we developed a module mm. which could fit in with the curriculum mm -hmm. uh, in the whole field of humanism. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the beauty of the question you asked earlier, that you can actually include what is relevant, mm -hmm. you know, as it emerges. Mm -hmm. And the humanism was a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. So that's the six. It could be contested that there are others. Our thinking, as I said, was taking expert advice on it and saying this has to be contained for the people who have to deliver it. Mm -hmm. But if people need to bring in other belief systems, we weren't uh, saying no to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay. I think you've talked about most of these already, actually. I'm just, this is great. Um, you've talked about, uh, you've mentioned quite a few times that how the students um, how some of the ideas were brought back to the students and how their mm. views were incorporated in that way. Um, parents? What was the forum for parents to...? Yeah, um, the forum, there wasn't a specific forum for parents. That isn't to say that parents weren't engaged with it, because they were. Mm. So as I explained, through the national forums, mm. you, uh, through the ethos conferences, you were capturing some of the parent voice. Yeah. Um, whether we had enough of the parent voice is debatable, mm. but it did, it was tested in two of the schools. Right. The themes were tested in two of the schools and through that the parents were actually given mm -hmm. a voice as well. Specifically, parents were not targeted yeah. uh, and that could be perceived as a weakness, but parent voice was captured in other ways. Mm -hmm. For me as a researcher, I wanted to capture the children's voice. Mm. I felt they were the ones that this was all about mm. and it's very rare, uh, certainly back then it was very rare to try and capture the children's voices. Mm -hmm. That was my main concern. Right. Um, the last couple of questions are really around the kind of teaching the practicalities of the curriculum and then mm. the continuing development of, of the curriculum. So as, as a, a teacher educator yourself, um, would you say that any particular pedagogical approaches um, would be better or worse suited to the teaching of ethical education and ethical education curriculum or the Learn Together in particular? Yeah, I mean at the, at the time, as I said, when we were developing this, we were looking at the new curriculum for primary schools. So the timing was, was very good in relation to that. And the whole focus on children-centred or person-centred or student-centred education mm. uh, was very strong. It always was in Educate Together, but it was coming very, very strong, uh, strongly to the fore. Um, so that underpinned it. Also, um, while we weren't against direct instruction, uh, you'll see when you look at the curriculum itself that the methodologies that were employed or that we suggested should be employed talked about a whole 
plethora of approaches like group work and mm -hmm. project work, mm -hmm. circle time, uh, Jenny Mosley, a lot of uh, schools were already using that so we suggested that that be used as well. Mm -hmm. So we were saying to people use the methodologies that you're using in other schools, in, in other subject fields but ensure that um, it is child-centred, it is person-centred. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a methodological perspective that, and from a philosophical perspective, mm -hmm. that would be the key one. The other one would be, would be the whole area, I suppose, of experiential learning. Mm -hmm. That students be given an opportunity to incorporate their experiences into the curriculum itself mm -hmm. and that their experiences were listened to and in turn brought back into play. So uh, there we have the activation, mm -hmm. you know, the issues, the local issues and the activation of those issues. Mm -hmm. And um, in testing this out, it was interesting in continuing the research with former students mm -hmm. uh, who had been, I suppose, exposed to previous or other curricula that they weren't as familiar with the language and they certainly weren't as familiar with that whole concept of activation. Mm. as hopefully the students today are. Right. Okay. Um, and then finally then, what kind of challenges and opportunities do you see in the extension of the Learn Together curriculum to second level? Um, where would you see it going from here? I think, I think what you will have created or worked through with students is uh, a world view, a particular world view, be it built on consensus pluralism or immoral universalism or whatever and that, that this is very much uh, there in the students that you have mm -hmm. uh, coming out of sixth class and hopefully that this can be captured and continued into um, first year, second year, third year, whatever. Um, I suppose I've thought long and hard about this and um, for me, the, the focus to me is very much about going back to the concept of citizenship and responsible and responsive citizens mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a, a caring Ireland. And I think if we build our curriculum around that, then I think we're probably on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, we have the themes already in place. There are, we're already looking at the values and we are now very much including parents in that. So a value statement that would underpin the new second level, a focus on, for me, caring and responsive and responsible citizens in the Ireland that they live in and in the world that they're going to inhabit mm -hmm. uh, into the future. And for me as well, coming from my own perspective, the whole notion of sustainability, mm -hmm. that they have an awareness of sustainability that they honour something, for example, like the Earth Charter, mm -hmm. and that they become change ag agents into the future. As we are producing at the moment in primary, that this is built on, it's a fantastic opportunity to build on it. Mm -hmm. Again, a note of caution that um, if we do develop a new, um, I'm reluctant to use the, the term curriculum, that we avoid uh, overlap with the other educations that are out there but we focus specifically on what is Educate Together and the people we're working with within Educate Together. What's our vision? Go back to the four principles and develop our new program, our new approach around that. Mm -hmm. Do you, you say you're reluctant to use the word curriculum. Any particular reason for the second level? Because I, I come from second level uh, background myself and as it's traditionally viewed, uh, curricula falls into just...